imagine that each morning when you wake up, you're smiling and looking forward to your day, knowing that you're happy, even while dealing with grief and loss. The Grief and Happiness Podcast inspires, comforts, and supports you with each new episode. For more support, check out the Grief and Happiness Handbook and Cards. I welcome you to listen to this podcast and discover endless possibilities for your life. Aloha. I'm so happy you've joined us today because I've got a wonderful guest. We had a great conversation a while back and I said, oh, you just got to come on the podcast. So here she is. This is Ellie Bambury and you're from New Zealand, right? Yeah, New Zealand. I was born in England though. Yes. Combination of accents. Huh? <laughs> yeah. So tell us a little bit about you and, and glitter and grief. I told a couple of people about glitter and grief and they said, what does glitter have to do with grief? So, but you can tell us. That's a really cool thing to dive straight into. So yeah, so I was born in the UK and emigrated to New Zealand when I was 12. And that was probably my first really vivid memory with grief because leaving everything behind as a 12 year old, everyone, you know, and have never been to the country that you're moving to before and just trusting, having blind faith in your parents to set life up for you. That was a massive change for me. And it was a bit of a catalyst in terms of really loving self-development and self-exploration. And yeah, over the years as a teenager, I was often at school in leadership positions and mentorship positions. And I loved being a leader at holiday programs for kids. And I've always been involved in the community very broadly. After I graduated college, so that's 18 years old in New Zealand, I went traveling, came back after a year, did a degree in filmmaking because I absolutely love theater and film and I love storytelling. And this is the very condensed version of how I got to Glitter and Grief. I've got a real big passion for storytelling and honoring people's journeys and really give, like doing them justice when we're, when we're sharing them. And I started my own coaching business for teenagers, helping them figure out life and that business was called The Big Sister Project. And it was also the title of my business at the time when I was kind of that big sister to so many teenagers. And I did that for about four years um, and up until 2023 when a few things, various life circumstances happened. And I had a bit of a, an awakening, I guess, around my purpose and my calling. And grief was something that I've had a lot of experiences with, both through losing family and also becoming like growing up coming of age stuff I've navigated what grief is and looking at the fact that we don't really talk about it beyond death in society if I mention grief people often associate it with losing a loved one not anything else um, so I've kind of explored that a lot more deeply for myself and that's where glitter and grief came into it I it's an event that I run in Auckland um, in New Zealand every second month now I've done four so far as of this interview probably five or maybe six. And yeah, it's it's a beautiful event for the community here. And I'm probably going to take it online at some stage as well, because there's been some curiosity from other places. But what it is, is I hire a space that's a really warm community space. And I bring resources, food, nibbles, drinks, and we basically dive into grief in different ways. And that can be different themes. So an example theme would be coming of age or you're becoming in life and exploring the versions of you that you are no longer or you no longer resonate with. We've done conflict resolution and self-expression and helping you get your needs met when you're grieving because often if we're in overwhelm, we can't really voice exactly what we need without confrontation sometimes. And yeah, so we, we explore different themes each time and there's an opportunity for the community. So it's teenagers right through to retirement age all genders are welcome and we explore through conversation, through self-reflection work, through games, and sometimes there's a bit of a meditative visualization practice as well. And at the end, the most powerful thing that we do is there's an opportunity for, it's like an invitation in a circle to come and sit opposite me and say something that they might have been holding on to for all their life or a realization they've had or just something they want to explore moving forward and be witnessed in that. And it's been really magical. I'm really loving it and can't wait to see where it goes. I think that's just fascinating. So many things dealing with grief happen with children and teenagers and they, the adults around them kind of tend to not recognize that or support it or help them with it. 
I've heard lots of stories of, of kids that they had a situation like one person I know had her dad die when she was 14, died suddenly, and she's a mature adult now, and she still hasn't gotten, you don't get over grief, but she, she still hasn't really resolved her feelings about it, and about not having him there when things that are important to her happen. And I've been kind of trying to see grief through other people's eyes to see where are the gaps, where are things that need to be done. And when I talked to you, I thought, oh, you get it. You know, you you have found an approach to younger people that they can resonate with. And that can really help them a lot. That That exercise that you do at the end where you sit with the chairs facing each other and look in each other's eyes. I just think that that's so powerful. Thank you. Yeah, it's definitely the one piece. If I had to choose all the things I've ever done, that is the most potent and it always has been. It's that witnessing. And it's interesting you say about your friend as well that that's now an adult. It's That's the piece that it often takes something big to happen, like losing a loved one, for us to then suddenly access all the other things we've never grieved or never understood as grief. And part of the, at least from what I've seen and experienced, part of the resolving of the feelings is actually like one thing I, I talk about at Glittering Grief and glitter is basically like the learning or the message or the magic in, in, the, in the heaviness is we can bury or cremate our loved ones, but we don't have any ritual around farewelling the version of ourselves that went with them or the lifestyle that we had that went with them. We're just expected to say bye to them and honor them and then forget that, that we're actually now a new person. It's like you're going to have different people around you. Think new things are going to show up, but we cling so much to what we were because there's no rite of passage that's built for us to understand that we're becoming something else. Oh, yeah. You you were just making me think about how uh, my grandmother died when I was, I think, 13 years old. I had spent so much time with her because my parents traveled a lot, and whenever they'd go someplace, they'd just drop me off at grandma's. <laughs> I'd be there for days on end, and. So I was closer to to my grandma than than most people, closer to her than my parents, because we could talk to each other. And my parents always seemed too too busy to talk or too tired, one or the other. So she just meant the world to me. And she wasn't sick as far as we knew it. She just died. That was, at that age, really hard to come to terms with. And it's like, here's the one person in my life that I was really close to and could really resonate with. And everybody else was so busy. Like mom and dad got all of her stuff out of her house and moved it into our garage because they, they needed to get it out so they could do something with the house. So all the all her stuff was there, but she was gone. And they went on with their lives because they were so busy. We had just purchased a new company and and my dad and mom and I were running an ambulance company together and we were busy 24 seven, literally with what we were doing. And it, the thought of grieving or it, it relating to me just wasn't there. And we never talked about it as a family at all. And I just kind of, I kind of stuffed it. I think that happens a lot with younger people because they're, they're not taken seriously, I think. No, I completely agree with you. And as you were kind of sharing that story, it's like having any family member pass away at that age, especially 13, like you must have been confused because that's the that's that coming of age piece of becoming a teenager. And then, well, who am I now if my parents are around me more? Like, how do I relate to them? And like, there's all those pieces. And that's the thing as well. I love that you brought that up with, with stuff, like having our stuff. Did it make you think about what she kept and why? Like, did you kind of dive into that? It, it really did, because it was interesting. My mom and dad had decided they were going to build their own house. Literally, they were going to build their own house. <laughs> and they got a piece of property, and they decided to start with the garage first so that they could make that into like an apartment and then then build on from there. So they built which would be like a big two-car garage and then partitioned it off a little bit. So they had a bedroom and we had a bathroom and, and another room. It didn't have a door or anything. It, it was in a hallway where my sister and I slept. Then there was this flood and nobody knew that it was going to flood where they were. 
and they had all their building materials and stuff just sitting out on the dirt and it all got ruined and their their dream house kind of didn't happen and so they decided they were just going to buy a house which was really hard for them because they put so much money into this house that they were building but they bought it and the place was sitting there empty at that time, my grandmother and grandfather lived out on, on a farm, and it, it was too much for them. They just needed to downsize and not have to feed the animals and do all the other stuff. And so mom and dad said, well, you can move into this place and just hope it doesn't flood again. <laughs> you know. So it was this, this little, really small house. They just, where the garage door was supposed to be, they just put boards over it. So it was a, a really interesting sort of a, a place to live. So she didn't have a lot of room to put her stuff. And I thought that in all the time that I'd been there with her, that I'd seen anything that she had. But a couple of years, well, several years after she died, my mom and I decided to go out and start clearing through stuff. And one of the things that we found just blew me away because she had been married before she was married to my grandfather. And I didn't really understand that before. Nobody ever talked about it, but I knew I had an uncle and I'm not sure I even knew about my aunt at that point that were from her first marriage. And then her husband worked about 30 miles away from where they lived. And the transportation was so bad at that time that they, he would go to work on Monday and come home back on Friday evening. And the, the rest of the time he'd be there because it just, it was impossible to travel that far every day to go to work. And he was, got sick at work one day and they put him on the train to send him to the closest hospital, which was a ways away. And by the time he got there, he had died from a ruptured appendix and left her with two small children. And I didn't know this whole story at all. I knew absolutely nothing about it. So we started doing these letters and I found that out. And I found out that that aunt that I didn't really know about, it would have been mom's half sister. I didn't even know she existed. I knew that I had these, this cousin that I wasn't really sure where he fit in because he didn't belong to anybody I knew in the family. And grandma had, had raised him because his mom, oh, this is such a long story. I'm trying to shorten it. The mom's sister, Aletha, she had her two boys out of wedlock. And in those days, you didn't do that. And you were you were like condemned forever. And she still really loved the guy that was the father. And he just essentially dumped her. And the youngest child had some sort of disease like cystic fibrosis. I, I, I wasn't clear on, on what it was, but he died. And so when he died and her, her love left her, she committed suicide. And in those days, that sort of thing didn't happen. So it was kind of a disgrace to the family. So nobody talked about it. And I found out all this while we're sitting there going through her stuff. But the best thing we found was this pile of letters that were tied together with a pretty ribbon. And it was just lovely to look at. And I said, can, can we open that ribbon and see what's in there? And Mom said, I guess. Well, it turned out to be the love letters that she and her husband, my grandmother and her husband had been writing back and forth since he was away all week, every week when he went to work. So they'd write each other a letter every day because there was no phone or anything. And they were beautiful. The handwriting was gorgeous. And they said the most beautiful things in these letters. It was so romantic. So, and I thought, boy, grandma was really in love. And that was so wonderful because the man she married that turned out to be my my grandfather was a very, very nice guy, but he was just a really nice guy. He, he, they had four children together. And so it was a total of six in the family. And I never saw romance with her, with my grandfather, but boy. They, they had such a lovely, beautiful relationship through these love letters that I found. And I was so grateful I found that and so disappointed when I went back to get them and they were gone. So I have no idea what happened to them because that, that was something I was going to cherish forever and pass down, but I don't have them. But at least I got to read them. Mm. And that will stay with you. Mm -hmm. That's so beautiful. It's, it reminds me of the notebook a little bit. Mm -hmm. Have you seen that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's gorgeous. It makes me think like, I don't know about you, I often find myself 
having a clear out and I can keep throwing clothes away or repurposing them or gifting them. And I seem to always have more and more and more, no matter how much I get rid of, there's always so much more. And I'm like, how, like, how have I accumulated so much stuff? But each time I've, since I've been working with people moving through grief, I've been a lot more intentional about what I'm keeping and why. Like I used to just be like, oh, I'll keep this and I'll keep this, but just in case kind of stuff. Whereas now I'm like, actually, does that bring me joy? Does that, do I wear it? Do I love it? Like what brings me that sense of connection? Finding stuff when people pass away and going through their stuff, like all those stories are other things that we have to go by moving forward. So it's like making me think in advance, like, okay, well, what stuff, like if I died tomorrow, what would I leave here? Like what would speak about me? I've been thinking about that a lot right now too. It's interesting that you you brought it up because I I was in a situation, my, my mom had a brain tumor that was inoperable. It wasn't cancer, but it, it grew and kept kind of scrambling her brain some. So I ended up caring for her for about the last year of her life. And a lot of that time she lived with us because I, I gave her a choice. I said, you can come live with me. Or you can have somebody come to your house here and stay 24 hours a day. Or I can find one of this really nice facility someplace where you could stay and there'd be lots of people there and you could have lots of friends and stuff. And so she decided to come live with me. <laughs> and that was wonderful. And then she she finally decided it was time for her to go back home, which was about two months before she died. So I was able to arrange for care to be there in the house. And I was going back and forth. And I was always so doing that. I kept finding stuff. <laughs> why do you have this? <laughs> and, you know, she couldn't answer and she couldn't do anything with the stuff anymore. So I had to figure out what to do with all that stuff. And it was tons of stuff. Like she ordered, she was a member of some sort of book club that sent her a book every month. She hadn't opened the boxes of about three years of books. And so I don't know whether she paid for them or not. She must have been paying for them because they kept coming. But I just took him to the post office and put return to sender on him. <laughs> I don't know if that was the right thing to do. But I had to make decisions about odd things like that because there, there was so much stuff there. And she also grew up during the, the Depression. So she saved everything. And I wouldn't call her a hoarder, but she if she had something, it, she kept it for life. And things that were important to her that to me, I didn't see any importance to it all. So it was it was a challenge going through all that stuff by myself. There was nobody to help me to go through all that stuff. And I ended up helping her sister, my, my aunt, who had the same kind of brain tumor that my mom had. And she had made arrangements a few years before I knew about it for me to make all her decisions for her and be her power of attorney and all that sort of thing. And had it all all legal and documented, but she didn't tell me. One of their other sisters got killed in a car accident. And after the accident, we all went over to my aunt's house. And she said, I've got something I've got to tell you. <laughs> I said, okay. And she said, because of that accident and their sister dying so unexpectedly, she thought that she better tell me about that she'd made me her executor and her her everything in all of her legal papers especially because she had a son who just assumed that he was going to be the one doing that. So it, it was kind of an awkward situation, but there, there were medical reasons that he wouldn't have been appropriate to do it, but he, he thought he, he was anyway. But she made sure that she made all those arrangements beforehand. Well, her house, she, it had always been immaculate when I was growing up, but once she started dealing with this brain tumor, it got worse and worse and worse. And... It was so bad, eventually we had to have the house torn down. It wasn't cost effective to try to repair it, to put it into a livable state. It kind of broke my heart because I thought if I would have known this was, I, I lived over an hour away, so I, I wasn't going over there all the time. And, and the decline was kind of rapid with her and I had no idea what was happening was, was happening. And with those two instances where I had to do so much with so much stuff that my mom had and that my aunt had that I thought, you know what, I got a lot of stuff in my house right now and it's going out. If I can give it to people that I know who want it, I do. I'm just trying to figure out what to do with a lot of different things like piles of books. You know, nobody needs piles of books. <laughs> 
So I'm I'm working through all that. And I think it's it's so important if we could all live learn to live without clutter. Not that any of this stuff didn't serve a purpose at, at a point in time, but if it's not serving that purpose anymore, if, if it no longer serves you, then give it to somebody it does. It's that keeps that cycle of life going, you know? Doesn't mean the thing the thing loses value, it just takes on a new meaning. Yeah. There's so many opportunities, you know, for, for people that live around you. I used to give all, all my clothes to the women's shelter here, and they were really appreciative of that. But then we had the fires in Lahaina that, that burned the whole town down, and so many people lost their homes and everything that they had. I mean, thousands of people. So now when I donate that sort of thing, if I don't have a specific person I want to give something to because I know it's something that they would like or enjoy or need or anything like that. If I don't have somebody specific, I give it to someplace where it's going to go to these survivors because it's going to be years before they get back in shape. I think that's one thing that we don't often think about. You might buy something on a whim and think, oh, this is cool. And then the next week you think, well, I don't really need that. It's funny you say that because I, I love going to markets when there's like handmade stuff and everything. And I used to be dangerous if I'd go to a market. I'd spend so much money on little trinkets and handmade candles and crystals and all the decoration things that had no place because there was nowhere to hang them. I just liked them. And now like, I can't count the amount of markets I've been to in the past couple of years where I've literally bought maybe one thing, like, or not even one. I just walk past and appreciate it. And then I'm like, okay, cool. I can go home now. I go for the enjoyment of being in the space of creativity rather than I need it, you know? And I think that's got to do with detachment, like not not attaching my my value or my anything to objects or what my space looks like. Everything has to be, like you said, have a purpose or serve something in my energy field rather than just because I can. Yeah, that's such an important lesson. If we can help somebody today who's listening to us to be able to make that adjustment in their lives, it can be life-changing. You know, you just feel differently about everything and about the value of things. I love to go there on Maui. We don't have a lot of museums or that sort of thing. But whenever I've traveled, I have loved to go into museums and just enjoy things. And there's a gift shop in museums that you can get something with if, if you want to. But in general, you're going there to just see and experience and enjoy the art or whatever it is that they've got there. By doing that, it made me kind of think like like with your your market trips, it's the experience of going there, being surrounded by it, getting to see incredibly beautiful things is enough. You don't have to personally own part of them. And it's it's given me a, a real appreciation of life to be able to to make that shift. Because before I think I thought I needed to have things. And now I see I just don't have that much anymore because I, I don't want it, you know, <laughs> I don't need it. I don't want it. There's no reason for it to be here in my house. And each thing that is here in my house is here for a purpose. And it does bring me joy. You mentioned if it, if it brings you joy, they, they do bring me joy or they're not here. Yeah, it's actually, as we're talking, it's making me want to have another clear out. But I'm looking around thinking, I don't know what I'd throw away but or get rid of, but I'm sure there is something here. Yes. <laughs> there always is. And it's interesting, like what that brought up for me just before when you were talking about all other things you were discovering and in the letters and the family members you didn't know existed and everything. Part of what I explore in Glittering Grief and anyone that works with me is not secrets, but secrets like the things that weren't exposed or the things that were pushed down. Because I think it was either the first or second event that I hosted, a woman came and I don't know her very well, but she came with the intention to move through the grief of a husband that had passed away years ago, like over a decade ago, that she she thought that that's what she was holding on to. But at the end of the event, she didn't tell me, but she told someone else who told me, essentially. She said that she didn't realize that she was holding on to some stuff that happened in her childhood that she'd pushed down. And that was like basically sabotaging her ability to grieve her husband and everything else in her life. And since then, it's had this massive ripple effect and she's found out all this other stuff that other people experienced in relation to what she went through. It's healed this huge part of her that she thought she'd moved on from and it's unlocked all this other stuff that actually 
she's realized it's not her husband that she's missing as much as like she of course she misses him but she's moved through the grief of it a lot more than she had with other things and her husband passing became the thing that she unconsciously was holding on to as the thing that was making her sad because it was easier than acknowledging all of the other stuff and I think that's one of the amazing things with grief is that it's an invitation to get re- really honest and far too often at least I've seen is people people pass away or something happens and our life changes and we're like oh my whole life vision has changed I'm going to seize the day I'm going to do xyz but that is very short-lived most of the time there are a few people that really do live that and change things quite drastically but most of most of the world it will be like the new year's resolution kind of vibe where they have this big intention to change their whole life and live differently but we often fall back down to the standard of where our belief system is and that's what I one of the reasons glitter and grief is there as well is to help people access what their belief systems are that are actually keeping them in this place of staying where they were and staying in discomfort so they can actually be like okay well what can I tweak to be able to live the life that I know I can live and want to live and not feel guilty about it because grief often brings up guilt as well like when's the right time to move on what would they think if I married someone else? You know, like all those questions come up and they're completely valid, but ultimately they're the things that will keep us stuck, not the person that is no longer in our life. That's right. I just agree with you a hundred percent. And that's, that's so amazing that she was able to have that gift from you of discovering what her situation actually was. We attach importance to things that aren't important. And when we recognize that we're doing that, then we can go, oh, okay, how can I fix this? That's why I love helping people learn about things to write about when they're grieving, because it, there's something about actually writing it out that makes you look at it in, in a, a way that's deeper so that you can discover things that you, you didn't know you were holding or you you didn't know you had to deal with and that, that you weren't going to really be able to move forward until you dealt with whatever it was. And people are just really surprised sometimes at the things that come up when they're writing. So I, I love to use writing to do the same sort of thing that, that you were doing. It's It's interesting how many different ways we can find to do a similar thing. And I always tell people that are grieving, if something's not working for you, try something else. You know, don't just stick with that. There's there's a million ways to deal with things and, and just keep keep trying or keep doing or do them all. You know, every time something comes along, do it. One of the things that I've done that, that I love is take art classes. I've taken different classes. The, the one that blew me away was that I could draw. I had no idea I, was, I could draw. My whole life, I thought I couldn't draw. I love the drawings I do now, and I've I've taken that into watercolors, and I do ceramics, and I do weaving, and, you know, do all this stuff, and it feels so good, and I'm allowing myself to do something just because it's fun. One of my big lessons I just realized recently is that I don't have to have a purpose for each one of those things that I create. I can paint a whole watercolor package full of paper with different flowers just for the experience of of learning different ways to paint the flowers. I'm not giving them to anybody. I'm just going through the process and just loving it and seeing how I can I can grow and get it so that I find some flowers that would be just perfect to put on a birthday card for somebody or whatever I'm I'm going to do with it. And it feels so good when you can just Find something where you can just relax. You can just breathe again. I'm so glad you brought that up because I am one of those people that's learning or relearning how to do that because I went down such a personal growth junkie kind of style lifestyle where everything had to have a purpose. And this is something that I think when people are moving through grief and learning different ways, they our brains tend to go to, okay, well, what's the lesson? What's the thing I can grow on? And that's great. And it definitely has its place, but taking to the extremes like I've been through means that you just forget how to have, do something just for the sake of it, just for the fun of it and the process, like you said, and I'm learning how to do that now. Like my partner talks to me about that all the time. He's like, what do you do just for you? That doesn't rely on anyone else that you don't need to tell anyone about, like just for you. And I've been playing with it a lot and it's 
is fascinating and it can really show us how much you know you start asking yourself well what am I avoiding if I have to have a lesson in everything if I have to improve something what am I trying to avoid looking at in myself why can't I just be at peace and then that in itself that question in itself is an invitation to paint for the sake of painting or the joy of painting or take a photo just because you can and I think guilt is one of those things that underpins everything because we live in a society that's very production oriented like well, what are you contributing or you're being lazy or there's all these stigmas around if you're not doing something you're wasting your time or you're wasting someone else's time but actually I think for me personally the more I've got still and quiet and sinking into things just for the flow the better the ideas have come like the, the more clear inspired thoughts have come like I had one I had an idea come to me today while I was in the car on the way to the dentist because I was playing some music from The Greatest Showman and that's one of my favorite mus musicals and I was just driving in the car enjoying the music and I was like oh and I had a bunch of creative ideas come and I haven't written them down but I will and yeah it's just little little things like that that I think for anyone moving through grief and is feeling guilty around being unproductive find ways to implement it slowly bit by bit in moments where you're driving or you're in the shower or doing something that is just for you anyway, and then you can build on it. Yes, that's wonderful. I love that. What are you avoiding? I just, that's, that's awesome. I'm going to use that for a writing topic in, in <laughs> my writing group because it's, that's just perfect. Oh, cool. Yeah, I'm glad that can help. We've talked longer than I thought we were going to. This is, this is really cool. I, I love talking to you so much. Same. What would you like to tell the people who've listened to this conversation to kind of tie it all together? Oh, so many things. I think if I tie it back to what I'm doing in the world of grief, Glissa is is one of those things. When it when the title for that event came to me, I was like, like your friend said, you know, what's glitter got to do with grief? And I thought, actually, what's glitter got to do with life? I think grief is a reflection of like we've been discussing, what do we value? Where's the magic? Where's the joy? Because grief can be heavy. It can be very all-consuming. And if we don't have a balance, if we don't have one, even 1% 1 to start to balance it the other way, that's when it can feel like it's it's a, a life sentence. So my encouragement would be find the glitter in whatever's going on for you, even if it feels like the end of the world. Sometimes people use humor as a way to get like to lighten the lighten the mood. Find something funny develop a sense of dark humor if you need to, to be able to lift yourself in the other direction and just add to that each day. I love that. That's just perfect. That's a, another good happiness topic <laughs> is find the glitter. What's the glitter in your life or that you, you seeking and didn't realize you were or that you cherish or whatever it is. That's really beautiful. I just love talking to you and I love what you're doing. And I love that you are helping teenagers, young adults, that, that kind of forgotten age group that is so important to have, to be able to deal with their grief in a positive, productive way that can help them live their best life because they did deal with it. Thank you. I really appreciated talking to you as well. And it's funny how we lost track of time. I had a feeling that might happen. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'm not surprised. <laughs> <laughs> but it was worth it. Every moment was worth it. How about you? Is there anything you I, I feel the same as you did. It's uh, I could go on talking to you for quite a while because we've got so many things that uh, we both essentially believe in with grief work and, and what we're doing. I love what you're doing and I love the positiveness that you come through to help them find the glitter. It's beautiful. Thank you so much. Very much appreciate that. And I love what you're doing as well. And I love the, the cover of your book and the flowers and the cultural flair that's behind you and the pink and everything about you has got so much lightness to it as well. There's so much synchronicity. Oh, thank you so much. I, I really appreciate that. Well, if you've enjoyed this conversation, you can find out more about Ellie in the show notes. And I'm sure you've enjoyed it. So you'll want to check out the show notes. <laughs> Always review and like the the podcast that you hear that touch your heart in some way. You'd be amazed at how much good those reviews do and how much 
comfort it can bring to people. So they're they're worth writing just for that, knowing that you don't have to know who you're writing to. You just know that what you have to say is important. So thanks for listening. Be sure you download this and come back often to listen to the podcasts and enjoy them and enjoy the rest of your day in your life. And we'll see you next week. Aloha. Do you want more comfort and support and happiness? Join the Grief and Happiness Alliance at our free gatherings on Zoom every Sunday. Visit my website at griefandhappiness.com and read my books, The Grief and Happiness Handbook, and get your set of the beautiful Grief and Happiness cards. Be sure to subscribe to our podcast, rate it, review it, and binge listen to all of our episodes. I can't wait to welcome you back to another episode of the Grief and Happiness Podcast.